to Steve. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very, very happy to be here. So, you know, before I begin uh, what will probably be a little bit of a, uh, a lecture, but I hope followed by conversation and discussion, uh, let me thank uh, the McGill University and Kermit for the invitation. It's fabulous to be back in Montreal to see Ayun in her wonderful studio, to see Steve again, to see Sean and, and friends. And, it's, and so it feels much more like a, an occasion for the uh, for reflection and sharing of ideas than it does uh, a kind of formal lecture. Uh, so I hope you'll take that uh, for what it's worth and uh, feel free to interrupt with questions or comments. Uh, we'll certainly take some time at the end to have an open discussion for, for any, of anything you want, want to talk about. Um, and so this is an odd pairing, I think, uh, a, a, a percussionist approaching the middle of his life, I hope, and, um, and the newest of the technologies. And I, I feel in a way that I am completely unprepared to address issues of music technology. Certainly my background has not prepared me as uh, for, su uh, for such a discussion. I never studied music technology. I am a, a, a utilizer, a user in, in my own way, but um, lack in some way a kind of systematic and, and global view of, of music technology. So when the invitation to speak to you came about, it was first of all a prompt to start to put things together in a way that might make some sense. But it also began me thinking about the kind of uh, odd fraternity that the world of percussion and the world of music technology share. Uh, for one, we are linked in the kind of classic iconic music history textbooks as uh, the new developments of the late 20th century. You know, under in that last three pages of Grout, for example, that deal with music from 1940 to 1950, you see that both you know, e electronics and percussion are listed as the, the things to deal with at, in, in post-war um, European and American music. And you read further that we both are involved in the, in quotation marks, liberation of sound, as though sound had somehow been imprisoned and it just took the right kind of people to, to, to break it out. And so there is a kind of odd kinship between percussion, which, is, which might be the very lowest tech uh, of the enterprises. I mean, percussion is defined best by its word in German, Schlagzeug. Schlag means to hit, and Zeug means stuff. So um, as a percussionist, one is not always associated with, with high-minded and refined uh, approaches to art. Uh, and so there's a sign of strange bedfellowship between percussion and, and, and technology. For one, the, the focus on the creation of sounds and the, the refinement of, of sounds has been sort of a central brief for both of our projects. Um, and secondly, I think, and maybe almost more importantly than that, each in its own way, percussion and music technology, has stood as a kind of placeholder against the prevailing aesthetic of late romanticism. This I'm now speaking again of of our inceptions in the in the mid in mid 20th century, so the kind of uh, indulgence of personal affect that was such a part of the performance of music uh, stopped in one way with the uh, advent of per pieces for percussion alone, and in another way with um, with the electronic music that was played back on on uh, devices sometimes that didn't even involve involve a human performer. So in a way, we were also the kind of firewall against the continuation of late romantic aesthetics. But I think actually most importantly for me is that both percussion and technology involve largely the culture of addition. Um, and so let me speak a little bit more about percussion right now because I feel like I have uh, a great deal more experience with that and we'll see to the, ex the extent to which some of these thoughts may transpose. Um, the world of percussion is best defined by the uh, equation, uh, well, let me, let me back up a half a step. We are not, as percussionists, instrumentalists in the purest sense. We are not instrumentalists in the way, for example, a cellist or a violinist or a piano, uh, a pianist is an instrumentalist. Because in each case, those people have actual instruments, and we do not. I have in my studio in San Diego about a thousand instruments, and having a thousand instruments is really very much like not having any instrument at all. So that if you're an instrumentalist like, the, like a cellist, you have a single object which has multiple sonic possibilities and expressive possibilities, and that object is activated by certain kinds of physical inflection. So you, the, the equation, in essence, um, uh, for a cello is 
n times 10,000. In other words, a single instrument capable of producing 10,000 times, 10,000 sounds, is activated by means of different kinds of performances to produce all of those kinds of things. The object doesn't change, the inflection changes. The world of percussion is almost the exact opposite of that. We have uh, a, largely single instruments which make one or a very few number of sounds, and if we don't have enough sounds, we don't activate further methods of inflection, we add objects. And so by, by virtue of this kind of entropic nature of percussion uh, playing, what we have in the late 20th century is a sort of gradually growing catalog of individual instances to address individualized problems. And, and as a result, we share, I think, a great deal of the vocabulary of music technology, which in my experience with it as a player, as a performer, is that a new device, a new tool is built to address a given new uh, musical instance. And that less effort, although certainly there are many counterexamples, practically many counterexamples to almost everything that I will, that I will say today, but many counterexamples where, whereby I electronic instruments have been built, in my experience with technology, there is a problem, something is designed to apply to that problem, it is used, it's successful if the problem is solved, it fails if the problem is not solved. No matter how refined a solution it might be, no matter how much promise it might have for other problems, if that instant problem is not solved, the, the object or the tool fails. This is exactly the way percussion has always, always worked. If you can imagine writing a piece for five woodblocks, for example, it's a very, very you know, impoverished palette of sound. So the solution from a composer would be to add a set of drums, maybe, or three cymbals, or in any event, to add until the problem at hand, the impoverishment of sound, is solved. And in my experience with technology, the very same kind of, um, the same kind of equation uh, uh, prevails. And each of us, percussionists and technology, uh, come out of a culture of coping. In other words, we don't have a language which connects each and every instance of our of our work, but we examine every instance for its problematic aspects and we, we endeavor to fix them. So in my experience as a percussion, percussionist, largely what I'm having to do is that each and every piece has a new paradigm, a new set of notational problems, a new physical disposition. Imagine, for example, if you were a pianist and middle C for a, the Brahms Quintet is in front of you, but for Piro Lunaire, it's down in the low register and for, you know, for uh, uh, Zanakis Mists, it's over here, for example. This is really the world of, of percussion where the physical apparatus is so mobile, so mutable, mutable from instrument, from piece to piece, that we are really engaged in a, okay, what fresh hell is this, basically, to, to quote Dorothy Parker. Every time the telephone rang, Dorothy Parker would say, ah, what fresh hell is this? And so when a new piece arrives on our, on our, on our desks, we are forced to detail a completely unique and paradigmatic set of problems. Again, it's a, an experience I suspect that many people who are working in the, inst in, in the, in the world of technology are, uh, can, can relate to. So we have a parallel history, and likewise, we have a parallel set of both values and liabilities. Um, neither is a particularly an instrumental tradition in the way I've just described. So neither percussion nor technology involves uh, fundamentally the building of a platform from which uh, multiple sort of trajectories can ensue. And we are almost always locked in a sort of function-specific uh, modality, as I've, as I've described. And that puts us into what I think of as an extremely um, precarious state. And that is the state in which limitation, as it's always been applied, to instrumental traditions fails to act. In the world of percussion, when you can make pretty much any sound you want at any given time, then the sort of limitation that one normally has in an instrument like the piano, the violin, or the cello is simply absent. Most of the 19th century, um, in terms of interpretive aesthetic, comes from adopting or understanding the known limitations of the musical language and pressing against them. I mean, all of the romantic idealism of striving or, or, um, or struggling, this kind of thing that fed the music of, of the mid-century, comes from trying to address the natural limitations of an instrument. 
If you have an instrument, therefore, without natural limitations, and that is, I think, probably part of the definition of an additive culture. So in the world of percussion, for example, you don't have enough sounds, keep adding until you get enough sounds. If you don't have the right kind of sound, keep carving away at the woodblock until you get just the right sound. In the absence of those kinds of limitations, the aesthetic device, <clears throat> in a culture that's absence essentially, uh, absent of essentially of limitation, then we have transitory antagonisms, but we almost never have something that is a systematic set of limitations with which we can work. In my world, at least, much of the last 25 years has been the creation of meaningful limitation. Um, and again, to draw briefly on the, on the model of percussion, the earliest percussion instrument, percussion setups by um, important composers, and I'm thinking now of Karlheinz Stockhausen and Siklus and, and Morton Feldman in The King of Denmark, Mark, were really reproductions of the 19th century orchestra. Or a little bit like Noah's Ark. You know, you have two of all the clean instruments and 13 of all the unclean instruments, and you put them all together, and you create a little mini world whereby you have pitched instruments and noise. You have skin and wood. You have metal and you have you, muted instruments. And you get all of those things together and you're standing in the, little, in the middle of a little mini universe which resembles to a, an, an uncomfortable degree the kind of Enlightenment era uh, sonic constructions of the classical orchestra. And one negotiates those instruments in very much the same way that one might have negotiated an orchestra. But in the last, so 15 or 20 uh, years, starting with pieces like Zinakis Safa and Bone Alphabet, which I, both of which I played last night, the notion has been to create essentially a reduced palette of sound, to create fewer more than, rather than more options, and with the reduction of options to create more intensity in any given choice. And this, to me, has, seems to have paralleled also the development of music technology, whereby devices and tools have ceased to try to do everything. In other words, the um, normative explanation of music technology to me has been that it is always, that it's another kind of instrument, that it's another instrumental option, and it is an instrument like the piano is an instrument. And whereas that might have been the case, it seems now that the kind of function-specific application of much technology relates very strongly to the imposed sense of limitation the percussion has, rather than the kind of openness of the orchestral or, or model. So in a, in a weird way, um, and although we haven't, we haven't spoken in specific at all, it seems that in spite of my kind of utter lack of specific knowledge in the area of technology, that having been trained for 40 years as a percussionist has prepared me to deal with function-specific work it has prepared me to deal with the culture of addition, and it has pre prepared me to deal with technology as a non-instrumental specific art form. And so, in a way, maybe we're closer than we think. I'd like to change direction completely now and talk to you about um, a t-shirt I saw on the campus of UCSD in San Diego. Um, a guy was walking across the campus with a t-shirt that said, never stop exploring. And um, I, I, I wanted to stop him to, uh, to object to the notion of never stop exploring. Um, I mean, partly because I guess I come from a family of cultivators and rather than of, of explorers. My roots are in farming rather than in adventure. And I thought, well, you misunderstand. It turns out later that it's just a motto of some outdoor wear company. And so, and the guy was late for a class. It probably wasn't worth stopping him. And so I guess I'm glad I, I let him go. But the exploratory impulse, which is at the root of the creative, of, of most definitions of the creative act, seems to be not entirely, uh, it seems to have come, become privileged in a way that strikes me as unhealthy. Um, let me back, to, back up to say this. If you're a composer, a user, or a creator, or an inventor of technology, largely what drives you is the sense, or the, is the question, what would happen if we did this thing that hadn't ever been done before? And that is enough to go forward. In other words, simply creating something that hasn't existed is very, very often um, paramount to or, or uh, equals success. And in the world of composition, this has really driven the language, I think, in the last 60 to 70 years. How can I do something that has never been done before? And um, indeed, that does seem to be the main, the principal fire of under, you know, above which the creative pot boils. On the other hand, 
there seems to be a kind of abatement of, its, of the corollary force of consolidation in the world of, of contemporary music. In other words, what would happen, the consolidation asks the question, what would happen if we stayed here long enough so that we could take the, the newness that has just been discovered and weave it into some sort of meaningful language? That has been largely the province of performance in the world of, in the world of, of of, of composition, at least, so that the, the as new things are discovered, new pieces created, new forms explored, the performer's job has been to say, "Great, now let's make sense of it. Let's figure out how these things correlate and inter intertwine." And as performance has changed, I think a lot of the um, a lot of the trajectories that performers have traditionally represented have become abated. So. Part of what I would like to say in terms, of the crit in, in terms of applying critical leverage to our common situation is that performers have got to rethink their roles relative to technology. It's natural, I think, that technologists force the issue of invention, of exploration. Composers, very much the same way. But performers need to be able to develop practice out of exploration. Now, that is a complex kind of issue for me, how to develop a practice. But without practice, what we have is essentially a landscape littered with various temporary instantiations of ideas. So here you have something that is a good idea, and you make a piece for that idea. Uh, a, a technological tool is invented for the idea, and a piece is composed, and the piece is only as good as, it is, as it's needed to be in order to test the idea. As soon as that idea has been inhabited and a composer or an inventor wishes to go on, that piece is no longer relevant, you move on to the next piece. In a way, they're not even really pieces. They're kind of etudes to test the legitimacy of a technological or a compositional ideal. And um, I am old-fashioned to the extent that I, and I hope you'll pardon my painting with very, very broad brushstrokes here, but I believe in the great work still. And I believe in the necessity for great work for a, for a number of reasons. Now let me just quickly asterisk that to say that there are many, many ways to make music besides making great works of, of art. There are lots of ways of doing it. It's not the end all and it is not the sole paradigm. But it is for me an important part of the paradigm because the work of music, the piece of music that coalesces uh, a creative urge of exploration and a performative urge of consolidation and language building provides the spine of memory through which all of our lives will run. In other words, if pieces of music are instances along the process of exploration and, are util and have utility only as instances and are to be discarded when that moment of exploration passes, then we essentially have written off um, institutional memory as, a, as, a, as, as, a, as an important force in our, in, our, in our lives. Why do we remember so clearly the pieces for uh, instrument and tape? It's because they're great works. When I play Contacta, I revisit not just a, a piece of music by Caroline Stockhausen, I revisit, in fact, an aesthetic and a time uh, that is rooted in the, in the late 1950s and early 1960s. It provides not just a sort of extremely palatable experience in a concert hall. It encodes the memory of what was going on at that time. And what I've noticed really lately is that the idea of a kind of, of the permanent trace of memory has been supplanted by a series of test cases. Um, it is, I suppose, typical of the digital age because one of the problems of, digital, of the digital age is what I think of as entity threshold. We, or asking it as in, in the terms of a question, how do you know when you have something or when you don't? Now, in 1950, let's take you know something that you know uh, you know extraneous to our to our world. If you had a picture in 1950, you knew when you had it because you picked it up from the drugstore, and it was a picture of your Aunt Mary Lou baking a pie, and there it was, and you had it. It, it went from not existing to existing, and your only question at that moment was where to store it how to keep it, and how to deploy it. When did it become relevant? Uh, and it was a fixed thing. It didn't change except that for, for perhaps, you know, fading a little bit or curling up at the ed edges. Now, 
Obviously, in the world of digital photography, such a, a permanent state of an image is almost impossible to imagine. Once it's there, it can be endlessly reproduced, it can be cloned, it can be, there can be sections of it highlighted and amplified, and there is never a point at which you say, here is this thing and here is what we have. We have it in our hands. It is almost completely uh, uh, destined or damned, if you will, to, res to reside in a, in a fluid state. Now, in such a world, memory and the force of memory becomes a very, very interesting and it becomes a very, very slippery topic. If you don't know what you have, what are you supposed to remember? How are you supposed to um, measure uh, your position at any given moment? How are you supposed to compare instances uh, between similar kinds of examples when you don't ever have something in the hand? So for me, the creation of embodied works, and by embodied work I mean something that represents the tool, the inventor, the creator, and the moment, is an essential aspect of at least at that instant saying, here is what we have. And it can be referred to, and it has pull because one wishes in such an instance to recreate such, such works. So, um, the, whereas the exploratory impulse has a uniquely linear quality, and that is defined at as forward at all costs. The consolidational, uh, if you'll pardon that expression, impulse, the one that is exerted often by performers, seeks to fix such moments as platforms and, and seeks to create a, a, a language from which all things can, with which all things can be discussed. So, um, I tend to think if there is a problem, and I'm, I, I'm not suggesting that we're in the moment of crisis, but I do think that we have come slightly out of balance. Because you can't imagine, I'll, I'll, I'll interrupt myself to say something that I might probably regret because I think this is p potentially an indefensible argument, but I'm going to throw it out in, in, any, in any event. We have at points lived in times at which, which I call happy times, HT, uh, which represent in some way or another a, a relative balance, a relative equilibrium of these kinds of forces. In other words, the force of exploration as exerted by inventors and creators is balanced by the force of consolidation by practitioners, and both of them are hooked and plugged into uh, an, uh, 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 an informing or nourishing world so that the worldview of any given moment is reflected in these, in these forces. I mean, I think, for example, of the, of the development of music te musical technology in the late 18th century, in which instrumental practice was consolidated, uh, new things were built, they were immediately tested with great works of music, and all of those things uh, seemed naturally to grow out of the philosophical, artistic, and political concerns of the time. Another such HT probably took place, at least in my view, in the late 1920s and early 1930s, where the instrument that I play first exploded and came onto the scene. So that percussion music, noise-making music, was, um, was promulgated, it was amplified, it came into existence, and it was directly related to the, to the social and political concerns of the time, and it was exploratory, and there were practitioners involved in, in, uh, in, in creating a kind of consolidated practice. Now, the difference between the performers of both the late 18th century and the early 1930s, let's say, and the performers of today, were that in very, very many cases, the performers of the eight, late 18th century and the 1930s were in fact also the creators. So that a kind of holistic, uh, organic relationship amongst these various forces was naturally to be, to be found. Performers now are schooled in many, many cases as performers only. And that becomes very confused with the notion of, with the notion of, of executant, of executor. So, the, qu the question for a performer relative to both percussion and music technology is, what precisely is the function here? If the function of a performer in music technology is simply to be the necessary human presence on stage to activate, to play the sound that will be transformed, to hit the foot pedal that triggers the processing, to whatever, then that person is extremely unlikely to make a demand, to push back on the exploratory impulse and to create the necessity for practice because the executive has no stake in, in doing things once or 50 times. It doesn't make much difference. If, on the other hand, the, the performer has an independent aesthetic and artistic view, has needs, has risks, 
has a risk and reward system that is separate from, even if parallel to that of the explorer and the inventor, then naturally there is a kind of friction that results from the desire to create a practice, the desire to perpetuate that practice, to create a pedagogy, and the desire to create works of art that can be, can, can be played in, in, in public. So I'm wondering sometimes whether or not by developing a kind of independent and self-standing class of performers, we have unplugged a critical element in the, um, in the feedback system. And whether or not performers, even if they don't ever double as composers or inventors, and I have to confess, I am one of those people, you know? I'm a drummer. I don't compose. I don't know how to run the technological systems that I use on stage. I barely can tie my shoes. I, I, I feel lucky if I can find my office, you know? Uh, and so I am one of those kinds of, of, of performers that was trained. I could have gone into an orchestra. I could have played contemporary music, which I did. But I was not ever one of the uh, composer performers, uh, never ad adopted the role similar to the late 18th century or the early 20th century. So if that's my situation, and I know that I'm not unique, then what is incumbent upon me is to develop, actually, a brief, a project, which pushes back on the exploratory, um, the exploratory urge and seeks to create the texture of language. Now, how in the world does that happen? For one, it seems to me that that urge needs to have natural and inherent limitations. In other words, it seeks to impose a limit that the additive process of exploration does not naturally have. The second thing uh, is that, that, the, that the urge towards consolidation involves, in essence, both the issues of memory, which I've addressed very, very briefly, and the issues of pedagogy, which in my mind really is another way of looking at memory. And it is designed towards um, repeatable and inflectable works of art. So, if you're in the, in, the, in the culture of addition and the forward march through that culture really means that you test an idea and then you discard it, <clears throat> then the notion of inflecting an idea almost never comes to pass. The notion of trying it this way as opposed to this way is very, very difficult to instantiate. So it seems to me that the, that the role of a performer is to slow the process a little bit down, to slow the process and to, to ask for a horizontal growth, to ask for completeness and organicity before simply moving ahead. Now, I have some examples that I'd like to play for you, and we can get to that in just, in just a second. But as I postulate this kind of culture of consolidation that is a part of the performer's personality, I also think about my particular relationships with composers. And in particular, uh, we'll talk at some length with, about the piece by Roger Reynolds that I played last night, and which actually um, saw its, its birth here in Montreal and in some, in some very interesting experiments that we all did a couple, of, a couple of years ago. And it's a tug of war with Roger. And I, I, I'm not speaking out of school because he and I have had these conversations where the technology advances almost in its own mind because things can be done and so therefore they must be done. But my um, approach to music doesn't really is not particularly compatible with that point of view. In other words, when I get a piece of music, I first of all learn it. And that is then a stable, limited platform, a practice, so to speak, that can be inflected in numerous performances. I mean, just to give you an example, I think that last night was something like my 700th performance of Safa, more or less. You know? And so I've seen that piece through 31 years. You know, I've, I've, uh, I've seen it through good and bad times of life. It is a kind of journal of my of my life as a musician. And so it is constantly being inflected. In other words, it's constantly being pushed to respond to a particular circumstance, such as the one I found myself in last night. A hall that's resonant and yet clear. Uh, an audience of, of knowledgeable listeners with respect to contemporary music, but who also want a concert experience. This places an unbelievable amount of pressure on a particular instance of Safa. And so what you heard last night was not an exploration of Safa, but my inflection of, an, of that thing which is now to me a known given. So when I talk to Roger about chatter clatter, we have sometimes problems in that to, to Roger, chatter clatter will probably never be finished. It will never reside in a spot where I can come back to it. It will hold still and I will move. 
And from that standpoint, it's really, really difficult. For example, the, the, there's a section in the middle which involves interactive technology, and we'll talk about this in, in detail in a, in, a, in a second. Interactive technologies, which was, and I think now in its third or fourth revision, uh, new technology is made and a new score appears. And in fact, I knew I was in trouble when a few weeks ago we were going to play the piece again and I knew I was going to play it here. And I asked Roger for a new copy of the score and he said, I'll get it to you in a couple of days. And I'm thinking, but the piece was done two years ago, wasn't it? I mean, it, it, it becomes this moment where, all right, I now in very banal and practical terms need to relearn this section in order to accommodate a new technology. It is, in terms of my physical memory, a, the weak link in the section. It's why I cannot or have not memorized the piece, because it doesn't hold still. I don't know what to memorize. And, um, and here we are in an instance where I will never be able to inflect it, because the next time I play the piece, it will be, in a sense, a different piece. Now, it, that means that the piece serves very, very well the, the, um, the proposition of exploration and serves relatively poorly at the moment the proposition of consolidation and inflection. That may change. Roger will undoubtedly move on to a new piece. That will be left alone. Will be, we, it will probably settle. And I think these are the natural kind of cross currents of collaborations. And, and I, I hope I'm not giving anybody the idea that this has been anything but a, you know, an extraordinarily positive relationship for me. On the other hand, I'm waiting for that moment when I can say, yeah, this thing's not going to change again. I can memorize it. And I can play it in a lot of different instances to see how it will react in different acoustics. So it seems to me that the notion of the performer is to push back on the, the proposition of, of, of linear exploration and to force a kind of pooling of resources of multiple instances so that essentially a language happens. As a pedagogue, and I'm, I'm really devoted to teaching and I'm, I, I feel strongly about the integrity of the teaching and not just, and not just of, of, uh, of performance, it seems to me that if I have had a, ple a piece for, for um, percussion and technology for four years, and I'm the only person who has ever played it, then that's a failure. In fact, I would go on beyond, beyond that to say, if I've commissioned any piece, and I'm the only person who has ever played it after a period of three or four years, that it's a failure. What is necessary is not simply my personal um, force of consolidation, my personal breaking, so to speak, of the forward momentum ex of exploration. What is necessary for the longevity and the vitality of the art is to engender a conversation amongst practitioners. So that the conversation, when it is limited only to the conversation between an inventor, a creator, and a practitioner, if that's the only place it takes place, it has, it has uh, some impoverishment, in my opinion. The most interesting and the most important conversations that have that have happened in the world of percussion take place normally between the first generation of practitioners and the second generation. In other words, the conversation that I would have with a student about a piece that I commissioned. That is where language is developed. That is where performance practice is established. And that is where the real pushback of exploration takes place. When the question is, how do we do this? Is this the way we do it, or is just this the way you do it? When that question is posed, then something really, really important happens. Uh, for that to happen, I think that the notion that one is constantly going forward has to be challenged. There are different kinds of directions. So there are a number of questions that I think are relevant to a performer engaging with technology or a performer engaging with anything actual. Um, does a piece create or impede a sense of community? In other words, can it be utilized to create this new kind of discussion and conversation? Or does it, does it run counter to that? And so that's number, number one. Number two, in what way does the presence of technology in a piece of music change the way the piece is played? I mean, it's something that hardly ever anyone thinks about. One, one t generally thinks of performance as this thing that gets laid on at the end, and it's a given. And I can, I can tell you that, and um, let me use the example of, the, of Kaya Sariaho's piece, The Six Japanese Gardens. I've played it in three different versions and with radically different interpretive strategies depending on the version. The first time I played it was at ICMC in Hong Kong. And that, I don't think it was, no, it wasn't the premiere, but it was one of the first few performances of the, of the piece. And for some reason, there was a problem between Kaya and the, and the presenters of ICMC and the technology wasn't available for the, the interactive technology was not available. In other words, 
it, all it is is sound files triggered by a foot pedal, but that, that wasn't at that moment possible. And so Kaya made for me a CD. She, in other words, she estimated a version where there were the retardandi and the accelerandi were built in, and she thought, counted it through, and she pushed the pedals herself, and she recorded it, and she gave me a CD. And it was like a piece with, with uh, electro, you know, instrument and tape. And I learned it that way, and I learned it extremely dry, dryly, so that none of my normal kind of affectation as a performer would mean that the, 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 the time sense would be degraded. I needed to be able to kind of play on the dot and on the spot. And so I played the piece that way for many, many years, and it seemed to be a kind of sober, uh, you know, almost zen-like uh, um, illumination of this, of this subject. Then, you know, later I got the, the, the technology was working and I was able to trigger the sound files with foot pedal, radically changed the way I played the piece. Because then I didn't have to worry about exactly my move from t quarter note 108 to quarter note 92. I could play, I could, I could retard much slower. I could make a rallentando to a much lar larger extent, for example, because I knew that the sounds would be there when I pressed my foot, right? And that became, I think, the closest version to the piece that she envisioned. And then last year, I played it in the Disney Hall in Los Angeles, and Jean-Baptiste Barrier was there, and he uh, had a, a kind of visual mix of what was going on, as, as Jean-Baptiste is doing these days. And I became so, you know, I don't know if you, if for performers here, I know you know this feeling when you realize that nobody's listening. Um, and so I was playing, and then I realized everybody's at the movies, you know? They're, I could do kind of whatever I wanted to because the, the, the focus was uh, drawn to the screen. And even though it was a movie of me, first of all, it was a movie of me out of phase because of the latency issues of the, of the, of the computer processing. Um, and it changed radically the economy of perception. And that was one of the most critical issues that I think in working with music technology. What is the economy of perception? And in, in very, very basic terms, um, and that's why this video montage version of, of, of the Sarayahu doesn't work for me. In very, very basic terms, when you have more of something, it's worth less. So that if you create a um, 100 sounds where once there were three, then each one of those new sounds is worth, worth less, perceptually speaking, than the original three were. If you flood a space with perceptual detail, then the move that is very, very finely calculated towards a triangle or a a guiro becomes unreadable. It's a side of fries in a, in a huge buffet, you know? It's, um, and so when I, the thing then I, that I practiced, the precise moment part of the tambourine that I was going to strike to get just that right sound had no, had no currency anymore because it wasn't reading in the now oversaturated uh, perceptual environment. So the question, that's a long story to say, is that how does the performer cope and control, cope with and control the fluctuations in the economy of the perceptual space? That's a critical issue to, to um, performers. Now, before we go on to the examples, let me say that I, I, the little that I do understand about technology, I, I do understand that technology is a word that encompasses an enormous number of practices, an enormous number of aesthetic points of view, and it's not a monolith, not anything like it. But there are kinds of practices that I think we've responded to. Um, there is the practice that is essentially reactive. In other words, a performer plays with a fixed electronic element, whether that be a tape or sound files, things that will not change in a new acoustical space. And there, the principal problem for the performer is to make it sound like the thing that's going to happen anyway is reacting to you. If, in fact, your goal is to create a kind of mutable, plasmic space where it seems like there's a correlation between what you do and what happens. So if you play contacta, for example, and you know that at 10.4 seconds, you're going to get a which is where it comes, you have to play in such a way that at 10.4 seconds, that thing sounds like it's reacting to you, even though it's going to happen no matter what. And I remember last time I used this really silly analogy, but I'm, I'm fond of it enough to use it again, if you don't mind. And that is that in the, in the Denver airport, there is a, a train that connects the terminals. I don't know if, if you've ever been there. but um, and, and so I remember once being late for a flight, and I stuck my umbrella in the, in the door to open it, and I got on, and the voice, the pre-recorded voice says, you have been delayed because someone has interfered with the automatic closing of the doors. And so 
you know, you, everybody looks at you and all that sort of stuff. And then the next time, I waited <clears throat> until the last minute and I stuck my umbrella, or this time I think my hand in the door, because, you know, a, a good joke is worth even an injury. And I walked onto the train and I said, why have we been delayed? And the speaker said, you have been delayed <clears throat> because of someone has interfered in the automatic closing of the doors. This is what it's like to play with tape. You do something that makes the thing that's going to happen anyway sound like it was prompted. Now, in real-time processing, to a very large ex extent, the equation is reversed. Since you first have to put something into the system for it to work, naturally, the live music happens first and the processing happens second. So how can you sound like you're reacting to the processing? That's one of the really, really difficult kinds, kinds of things to do. It reminds me of that wonderful statement of Borges where he said about, uh, I said about Kafka that he was so important that he influenced even people who came before him. And uh, <laughs> so in the world of, of playing with real-time technology, very often what you have to do is to, to play uh, an answer followed by the question in such a way that the mind reverses the two and it seems like an, uh, a plastic and interactive environment rather than one in which the electronics naturally follow the, um, follow the, the, the performance. I'd like to talk about um, some examples and, I, and I'd like to actually really see them as paradigms for certain kinds of ways that instruments and technology work, work together. And I'm going to give you the, um, the three names that I'm using to talk about these paradigms and you can decide whether you like the names or not. The first um, is estrangement, and that is really uh, the process by which technology takes something known and creates something other out of it, and we'll talk about that in a second. The second is what I call dis or relocation, um, taking, uh, in other words, changing the interface between either the player and the sonic object or the listener and the sonic object. And thirdly, I think of uh, another, uh, uh, one of the aspects of playing with technology as enriching the membrane. Uh, by, by the membrane, I mean the kind of separation, the boundaries between the three states of sound in technology. In other words, the process of capture, the process of storage, and the process of reproduction. And um, in between those are membranes that have to be negotiated. And, and at least uh, from the perspective of this percussionist, uh, they are often not discussed widely. Um, and I'm, I'd like to talk about both what happens in the capture mode and also what happens in the reproduction mode. All right, so I have some examples, but the first piece I'd like to talk about is one that I played last night, and that is, and we'll, we'll basically go from low to higher tech. The lowest tech piece that I play is Gustavo Aguilar's piece called uh, Wendell's History for Steve. Um, and that's the piece that consisted, first of all, of this very little, innocent little improvisation. Uh, which I had a, just a CD backing track. I improvised with it. I recorded myself on a handheld tape recorder, and that was the first part. The second part was replaying the improvisation and reciting a poem uh, called History by Wendell Berry. So that's thus Wendell's history. Um, and now, what I didn't do last night, because we just ran out of, out of time for rehearsal, is that normally what you do when you have the mobility of walking around with a, with a handheld tape recorder is that you can, I would ordinarily have left the room and walked out and, and walked off into the distance just as the character in the poem did, uh, but it was dark and, and I didn't know exactly where the stairs were and uh, the light looked nice and so I just stayed right there. But the idea that there is this estrangement is still very, very critical to me. In other words, there's music that's caused by playing a timpani and some crotales and that belongs to an object and that object has a place in the world and a place on stage, furthermore. And you can, by the use of technology, then estrange the result from its cause, in other words, by carrying it around. You can imagine that this is a, a fundamental paradigm of almost all technology. You take something known, you create something less well-known. You create something other out of it. And that can be um, something as, as basic as what I did last night, but it can also involve all kinds of signal processing, uh, reverberation is a kind of estrangement. Anything that creates something that we know and makes it into something that we don't know. I love the physical estrangement because percussionists and technologists are tied to stuff in a way that instrumentalists, most other instrumentalists are not. If you're a conductor or a vocalist, you really have no knowledge of the amount of crap that you need to have in order to be either a percussionist or a technologist. And because that crap is site-specific, 
and exists, resides in a certain place, the instant you move any of it or that you can carry it or you can relocate it, uh, it becomes a very, very kind of powerful thing. A singer walking across the stage singing is not nearly the same kind of thing as a sound moving between speakers. Uh, I don't think singers have been worried about vocal spatialization for the last 30 years. They simply walk and sing while they walk. Um, so that's, that's one. Uh, let's spend a little bit of time now talking about the issue of, of dis and relocation. And there are two sub subcategories there. The first is proximity. In other words, how do you change the, the, percept the, 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 the perceptual distance from the source? This, of course, is, is, has been you know, historically the function of the microphone. You know, uh, certainly would not be the only one to say that the microphone is the great invention of the 20th century, and I ask my freshman students at UCSD, non-music majors, what is the function of the microphone, and they all say to make things louder. Um, and they kind of have a point because it's hard to make them louder without a microphone, but of course that's not what the microphone does. The microphone allows you to sit in row triple Z at a stadium at an Elvis Costello concert and have him whisper in your ear. And it's so um, dislocating because when you hear things, and we know that sound uh, imposes property lines, right? So that if you are listening to your neighbor's uh, private conversation, you are trespassing by nature. That's by definition. So when you have someone whispering, I love you, and you hear it from 100 yards away, you have this kind of dislocation of proximity. In the same way that if you needed to say, I love you to someone 100 yards away, you would have an equal dislocation, like, I love you. Uh, no, not so much you. You. Yeah, you. And, and so with the, with the microphone and this means of capture, we have the ability to radically change uh, the, 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 um, the, the sense of proximity, which is really the driving force in uh, Alvin Lussier's piece and much of Alvin's music for that, from that standpoint. So the beautiful thing about the triangle is not just that it's a bent piece of metal that you can carry easily, but that if you listen to it from this far away, you hear things that you cannot hear from that far away. And so, you know, a lot of what, of the earliest experiments in, 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 live, in live processing of, of instrumental sounds, uh, Silver Streetcar is one of them, but I think probably the best example is Microphonie, uh, is really essentially revisiting the notion of proximity. Wouldn't it be great if you could hear the tam-tam with your ear this close? And what sounds would you hear? Well, obviously, Stockhausen answers that question, and Lucier answers that question. Um, the other principal uh, means by which of, of relocation, and of course these are very basic concepts to people who have been working in this field, but they're very relevant and palpable to the performer, is the issue of space. Obviously spatialization has been a, a topic that's been widely discussed and addressed, and, um, and sometimes successfully, not always. I, can, I sometimes think of the kind of paradigm you know, image when, when it comes to spatialization of four really smart guys in the middle of the room saying, I think it's moving. It's, it's, I think it's kind of moving, right? You know, and Zanakis, by the way, solved that problem by saying, if you want a sound to come from over there, you put an instrument over there, and you play it right there. And that's where the, why Persefasa or Teratector works so beautifully, that there's nothing as palpable as something that's coming, that's something that's coming from there. Now, I'd like to play it a little bit of an example of, of space, although we're going to hear it in a stereo version. Uh, so we're not going to hear it quite as, um, quite as well. And this is a, a project that I've done with Sharok Yadagari, who is a computer musician and, and, and um, a professor at UCSD. I did a, a version of the, um, of the Kurt Schwitter's Ur Sonata, so for solo voice and computer processing. And uh, Sharok has, a, has a, um, a computer music instrument that he calls Lila, which is a Sanskrit word. And he, um, with it, he does, he loops, he spatializes, sort of basic uh, kinds of technology, except that it's based on uh, systems that he has derived from Iranian, from Persian music, and in ways that I don't completely understand. But I'd like to give you a couple of examples of where that might come from. Um, let's do this one first. <laughs> Lending, 
This is the opening of the fourth movement of the Or Sonata, and there's a, a little glitchiness. It's, uh, it's supposed to be actually in sync, so I just imagine that it is. Um, in which there's the, the, the spoken text. This is a Kurzschwitter's poem that was written in the, over the course of about 10 years, from 1922 to 32. Uh, it's <clears throat> a Dada poem that consists of nonsense syllables constructed into musical forms. I was uh, learning this piece while I was in a circus in France. I was, I was the only boy that wanted to run away from the circus at a certain point. And I remember uh, being in Chalon, which is a beautiful little town in Burgundy, and memorizing this and sort of and then the town crazy person was 10 feet away from me also at this cafe going and there's a very thin line sometimes you know between practices anyway this is the this is an opening moment at which um, you know you're just hearing the voice now I'd like to move forward and see if we can find some of the spatialization and you can hear what Chiro <laughs> That's a, you know, a little bit of an example of what's happening. All, all that you're hearing right there is this kind of looping, and it's unfortunate that with the stereo you don't hear, every, you don't hear the movement, but um, obviously it's a, it's a result that Schwitters never envisioned. Uh, one more brief example of that, let's see, uh, do I know how to do this? Here are a set of loops that are set up. Uh, the third movement of, a, of any piece is a kind of scherzo or a, or a minuet and trio. And so uh, this is not in Schwitter's score, but we decided to set up a little, uh, well, you'll see it's a sort of weird lentler in back of a. Uh, and these are moving.
I think you get the idea there. Um, and the um, critical notion for me is that Sharok, like everybody else, uh, came after our first performance, uh, which was in New Orleans at the, um, at the ICMC there, I think. Uh, it was the first complete performance of the piece. And said, you know what I'm going to do? We're going to change this. We're going to have different kind of uh, spatialization. And, and I said, no, you know, we're going to, I think we need to keep this about the same so that the next time we play, we'll, I'll have a better idea of what you're going to do because he is, uh, mostly doing this stuff live, in other words, capturing and, and looping and spatializing, and the, the density that gets built up depends on what I do, and, and so we needed to find an equation where the platform would be stable enough so that we could come back to it and do it. And so, you know, he was very, very agreeable, but it was a conversation we needed to have to keep things, um, you know, stable enough to have, have the development of language there about that. Uh, I'll, I'll run through these uh, <clears throat> these examples pretty quickly uh, so, that we can, um, so that we can get on to conversation with questions that you might have. I'd like to talk about enriching the membrane a little bit. And in this particular regard, uh, I've done some work with people who are working in robotics, uh, which is something that I find as a performer to be really, really interesting because for the most part, it, it, it involves uh, things that hit things. In other words, these are not sounds that are produced by loudspeakers, but produced by uh, robotic objects. And so the membrane on that side, I mean, obviously, we deal with loudspeakers in our lives all the time to the point where they're ubiquitous. And, and one can talk about loudspeakers, but normally only to the extent that they filter the experience. In other words, do you have a good speaker system or a bad speaker system? How are you or organizing the speakers relative? How do you match speakers to certain kinds of needs? Now, uh, uh, earlier this month, no, it's all October already, early September, uh, my wife and I were 10 days in Costa Rica, which was an interesting kind of thing. <coughs> Mostly because for 10 days we were completely outside of the range of technology. So no cell phones, no computers, no televisions, radios. In fact, I realized that for almost a week and a half I didn't hear the sound of the speaker. I can't remember when I last had a long period of time where literally I didn't hear anything out of the loudspeaker at all. And I, and I don't think this is just projection, but I think it's actually really part of what happened was that my acuity, especially my spatial acuity, became more and more sensitive as the time went by. When I was walking in the rainforest, you would hear, and it was rain, it's the rainy season in Costa Rica, so it's raining all the time. Oh yeah, this tree has corrugated leaves and they're rougher sounding than that tree. Things that I might have missed before because the brain essentially is saying, you don't need to worry about that because the loudspeaker is not going to present sound that, that vividly. And so one of the, one of the interesting things um, for me is working with robotics because it is computer driven, technologically informed, but doesn't depend on the loudspeaker, at least not the stuff that I'm doing. This first piece um, is a piece that I'm commissioning from Paul Drescher, uh, the Bay Area composer. He's writing an hour long piece which is um, essentially a play for one person, that's me. And he's commissioned a team, or he's put together a team of instrument builder, uh, a dramaturg, Rindy Eckert, the, the wonderful actor, and um, Matt Heckert, who designs, who was one of the first people to design uh, robots for the show that became Bot Wars. And so Matt has made a bunch of robots. Here's a very brief example of, of uh, me playing with them. We'll see if this works or not. Oh, the beach ball of death. Oh, yeah, right, sorry. Okay, I need to back this up too. I right, hear some of the robots. That's, we'll start there. That's 
That's Paul playing a gigantic hurdy-gurdy that he's invented. It's about 30 feet long. And that's an automated motor so you can spin it and do it. Now here are some of the robots. They're actually designed to be dangerous so that they can fly off. It's a scary thing, actually. And that's Matt in the background. Um, this is not robotic at all, but rather than skip over it, it's about 30 seconds of a little improvisation with tempo blocks and ball bearings. This is another one of the robots. It's a big thunder sheet on a... And we'll stop this here to tell you that this is a play which will be premiered in Stanford. Um, and the, the, the text is, at the moment at least, who knows if it's going to change, about a man who so misses the sounds that have disappeared from the world, the ones that are extinct, you know, like the sounds of a film projector or the sounds of vinyl or the sound of, of a typewriter, that he builds machines to reproduce the things that he misses from his childhood. And he has constructed them in a studio and he has been given an eviction notice and he has a couple of hours before the eviction notice takes hold to figure out which of these sounds he will take with him because those he leaves, since they are actually associated with objects, he'll lose forever. And so that's a little bit of what's going on. Um, so here's one of these moments. The robots are moving a little bit in the background. I don't know if you can see them well. Now this little demo is made for um, purposes of keeping the funders happy. And what you can't see very well, and I'm afraid to say, is in the background a kind of uh, long ribbon that moves sort of like a proboscis. And the, and the robot uh, moves that way and it then touches various sounding objects there. And so the whole stage is, uh, well, maybe I'll just keep this going while I talk to you a little bit about it. Oh, that's the hurdy-gurdy. I'm not going to be able to talk over that. What, it, <laughs> what this um, means to me is it points out what I think of as the imposter effect when it comes to both, to any kind of technology, especially with robotics, that things have a beautiful kind of anthropomorphic quality unless they become too close to the human experience. Uh, so in other words, when you're dealing with this little proboscis that looks like it's searching for something, it becomes this really unbelievably endearing object on the other hand, a robotic element that looks too much like a human being searching for something immediately triggers our imposter reflex. The closer it looks to us, the more we say, oh, that's not right. And if you've ever been at a party in which the person is standing like this much too close to you, you realize that our, our sensitivities for what counts as OK and what doesn't is, are very, very fine. So in essence, it seems like in terms of the anthropomorphic aspect of robots, if they look nothing like human beings and sound nothing like human beings, then we are willing to accept them as partners. The closer they, the closer they come to us, the less we are likely to do so. So these robots are really don't look anything like humans. And um, so this piece is still very much in, in, um, in, in, in development. Uh, another uh, piece of uh, robot music, which I don't have an example, but I'll tell you briefly, is uh, 
uh, William Brent, who is a graduate student in the UCSD department, has built a, a number of, of, of robotic mallet triggers. So that these are really just simple boxes of wood with a plunger and a mallet. And the plunger pulls, and it pulls the bottom half of the mallet, and it basically activates the stick. And it's driven then by MIDI impulses that, are, that can be calibrated and programmed you know, temporally, extremely finely. And so you can get unbelievable rhythms to come out. He's got 16 of them. Um, and so they, you, know, you can get the sound of 16 notes hitting exactly together, which is not a sound that I've ever heard in the world of percussion because I can't even do two exactly together. Uh, but 16 together is quite a sound. Or you know, arpeggios rapidly. I mean, they, 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 all the kinds of things that you can imagine. And we've used it to play a piece of David Lang's. It's called Unchained Melody. It's a sweet little piece for eight notes on a glockenspiel in which you play that with one hand and with the other hand you play eight noise instruments. So pa pa pi pi po pi pa pi po pi pa pa pi po pi pa. And because of the f speed of it, you have to choose little teeny instruments to play live. You just can't move around that much and it becomes a very, you know, sort of like a little clockwork piece. Now with the robots which play the noise parts, these instruments can be huge be trash cans and bass drums and cymbals and everything like that. And so standing on stage, playing with them, when they're playing exactly right and your goal is to play with them, and we decided early on not to use a click track so that there would be a, you know, the sense of very fine distinctions of rhythm, 5, 17 alternating with, with you know, 5 and 7, 16 bars, etc. Um, it becomes this really tense sort of thing, which of course if there is a mistake it's the human performer who is at fault. The thing that makes the, the membrane, the reproduction side of the membrane, in other words, replacing loudspeakers with sounding objects interesting, is that these are objects which swing. And they hang, they move here and there. And so the kind of little things which you would normally have to program as a sort of artificial intelligence version of, of dirt or asynchrony happen naturally in the same way they do with a, with a live human performer. So those are two instances of working with, uh, with instrument makers, and especially in terms of robotics. And, um, and now I'd like to move on to, uh, to Roger's piece. And we'll pro I'll make this really quite quick, but because I think that we won't want to stay here forever. But again, maybe this is a moment at which somebody would have an incursion or a, a reaction or a question. Anybody? It's hot, isn't it? It's too hot to think. It's too hot to. It's too hot to be uh, to queer. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I believe your model is uh, no instruments, just sticks. Uh huh. Yeah, and um, I'm referring to the piece "Drumming" by Steve Wright. Yes. Mm -hmm. I believe you give a special attention in your, in your book. I do. Uh, it's the last piece you talk about. It is. And it seems to exemplify your model of no instruments, ju just sticks. And I'm wondering how <coughs> it does that. Well, I, I put Steve Reich at the, in that spot in the book because it seems to stand for a kind of um, process of collaboration, a democracy amongst musicians that I find is, is in short supply. Uh, in that no one in the world, in, in drumming or in Music for 18 or any of those pieces, no one can lead that, those performances. They have to be guided by a kind of committee of the whole. And that at every given moment, even though there are nine percussionists working in, in drumming, and there's a person who plays a kind of primary role at the beginning, there's always a moment at which somebody who plays the ninth marimba part, or whatever it happens to be, has the stewardship of the music. And I find that as a sort of social model, that's just really, that's really fascinating. And the impoverishment of the sound world, in other words, the fact that he's using homogenous sounds of, of bongos and, and, uh, and marimbas, means that the artistic leverage it comes from inflecting those sounds. In other words, it comes from the manipulation of the mallets rather than the choice of instruments. I've never been a collector. I, I choose every single time I have the option for the least ethnic sounding wood drum or for the most banal bongo or the, these things I, I, I seek the most transparent version of every instrument because I don't want the instrument, the instrument to be a kind of curtain between myself and the, and, the, and the listener. I know wonderful percussionists who have great collections. When I listen to them play, I often don't even hear them. What I hear is, oh, the bonang, or I hear the, uh, the anklun that that person collected in Indonesia, or the, or the beautiful African drum. And it, it's a kind of coloration which I find impedes the impedes the experience. And so that's why I, I think of the sticks. The sticks are only emblematic for the, the presence of the human in the, uh, you know, next to instruments. I don't know if that ha answers your question at all.
Okay? And furthermore, then we have an entirely different set of cultural issues to deal with, issues, questions that surround uh, appropriation of, of sounds, of the disembodiment of a sound from its culture. I mean, you take an, a, a, a gamelan gong from Indonesia, something which is in the Indonesian, in Indonesian culture has healing properties or has, has a, a, a central role in the community of musicians, and you say, well, let's play that with brass mallets or let's dip it into water or something like that, and it just doesn't sit right, and it seems hard from the North American perspective to enforce a kind of exploration at all costs to to an instrument which has existed in its, in its form for 5,000 years. So it has a lot of other problems as well, I think. Uh, um, maybe I'll play a little bit of Chatter Clatter. You heard the whole thing last night. I'd just like to talk a little bit about the technology since that's, um, I think, what the, what the topic is here. And, and uh, the, uh, so I'll put this in while, um, while I'm talking about. I had four coins. Uh, affixed to the little finger and thumb, and inside the coins, each each coin was uh, was a transducer, a piezo microphone, basically, and so that that sends an impulse. Now, the conversation that we had two years ago was how to read gesture. Of course, this is a is a very current um, you know topic, and gesture can be read in a lot of ways. But what Roger and I came up with as a result of our trip was to try for gesture by inference. In other words, if you know, if the computer can know that your thumb has just hit the farthest instrument, if you can find a way for the computer to know that, and we do that via the, the, the collated meanings of the impulses through the transducers and the sound coming through a, a microphone, then the body has to naturally be in this position. There's no other way for the thumb to come into contact with that, that instrument. Or if you can define a tremolo as the periodic alternation between thumb and little finger, then you don't need to read that as a motion. The computer can simply detect a certain kind of periodicity, and there's what that is. Um, there are three kinds of, of um, I don't know when, when this was last played, but let's find out. There are three kinds of, of, uh, of, of striking techniques. The simple strike, in other words, uh, 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 an impulse not followed immediately by another impulse or not in, in a periodic alternation. There's a tremolo, which is the periodic alternation between thumb and little finger of any given hand. And there's what Roger calls the crawls, this kind of chaotic mo moment of sort of scrambling up the instruments, which overload the system. Each of those feeds into the, into the, into the uh, system of manipulations in a, in a different kind of way. And the piece basically progresses as a series of capture points and um, modifications. Uh, by proliferating the sound or by smearing the sound or by altering it in some way. And then every, at, at, at moments of interactivity, I can control the amount of reverb, the amount of uh, proliferation, and the kind of response I get from the electronic system by the speed or the frequency with which I play the coins. So this is another example of where I think a stable platform uh, rather than an ongoing exploration is really going to be handy. If that holds still and I have a couple of concerts in which I can say, oh yeah, that really works in this way or it doesn't work in this way, then I can manipulate the piece that way. Uh, let's just take a look at it in, you know, in, from a perspective which might actually allow you to, uh, that's good enough. This is a concert we did at the Library of, um, the National Gallery of Art in, in last, last year. And so the right hand there is doing, uh, well, you'll see the difference between strikes and uh, tremolos pretty really easily, I think. Uh, of, a, of a larger piece called Sanctuary. Obviously, solo percussion, and the second two are pieces for percussion quartet, each involve the similar, kind, similar kinds of processing that, that really um, 
serve to proliferate these kinds of, to capture and then proliferate these kinds of elements. You'll notice that in none of the examples that I presented was there any concern for the creation of new sounds, or even really very much in terms of the, of the modification of sounds. The world of percussion has such richness in terms of sounds. It's the one thing we don't need. We have too many sounds as it is. And so my interest as a performer has always been in the change of perception. How can technology be used to put the viewer, the listener, or even the performer in a different kind of perspective with respect, with respect to the original or to a concert situation? In this particular case, it allows people to hear something which they might not be able to see. And that's in line with what Roger has been doing in the other, the other percussion pieces with technology, including Watershed that came before. Uh, obviously, the robotics have a similar kind of thing, but n in, in no case is there the kind of the normative notion of technology in which you say take a, a flute which has a difficult time producing a lot of different sounds and then use <clears throat> uh, signal processing to, uh, to, create, to, to create a richer palette. We already have a rich palette. What we really want to be able to do is to take the experience, the sensory feeling of actually touching those instruments, of interacting with them, and explode that and amplify it into a space in which more than one person can appreciate that. I feel like I've kept you quite a long time already in this warm room, and I appreciate the fact that you know, no one has thrown anything. Um, and there would be a chance to talk a little bit now, or if you just have had enough and, and are looking outside to see all that fresh air and you can hardly wait to get out, that's also an option. Uh, but that, that essentially concludes the prepared remarks I have. Thank you very much.